Welcome everyone to Ask the Pastor. Thank you for tuning in. I know we've been away for a little while, but uh, I'm glad to be back with you and hopefully uh, we'll be able to continue every week providing you with podcasts here on Ask the Pastor. Thank you for the questions that have been sent in. Now, the questions I'm going to answer today are over a month old now, uh, only because I've been away from the podcast for a little while. And, and so let me deal with three questions that we have for today. The first question the person asks is, does a Christian have to be ordained to baptize someone? Well, the answer is no. They, they do not have to be ordained to perform baptism. As a matter of fact, uh, you know, uh, examples that we see in Scripture, uh, there's, you can't be, there's no hard and fast rule on a person being ordained to baptize. What we do see is believers, baptized believers, baptizing other believers. And also, uh, this was the practice throughout church history as well. Now, that does not, well, let me go on to say this. That does not mean that churches can't have their own policies. Uh, for example, here at Edmonds First Baptist, even though we believe that the Bible teaches a baptized believer can baptize another baptized believer. At our church, our practice is that ordained, uh, that our ordained men are the one who baptize. And that's just our practice. We're not saying it's what the Bible says. No, it's just our practice. And we have our reason for, we have our reason for that practice. It's just a policy that we've adopted. And we have, we have reason for that. We're not saying this is what the Bible says. It's just our practice. I think it's also important to remember that the Lord did not give the ordinance of baptism to an individual. Uh, he gave it to the church. So bat baptism must be performed under the authority of a local New Testament church. Um, so if somebody's out there, you know, if Grandpa is baptizing his grandson in the swimming pool, well, that's not the practice that we see in Scripture. I'm not saying that baptism has to take place in church. It can be in a swimming pool, but it must be under the authority of the church because the Lord gave the ordinance of baptism to the church. So when someone baptizes someone, it has to be under the authority of the church, and any baptized believer can baptize another uh, believer. Uh, however, Every church is allowed to have their 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 practices, their tradition of how they do things, and uh, and that's you know same way here at First Baptist. I can give you a long explanation for why we don't just allow anyone to baptize another person because you know there's is that is that person an active member of the church? Is that person in good standing of the church? Uh, it, you know how well do we know this person? All those type of things. All these come into play when you realize that God gave the ordinance of baptism to the church. It's to be, it's to be, it's to be under the authority of the church. And so that means membership, church discipline, all these type of things come into play when you consider not only the person being baptized, but also the person who is administering the very act of baptism. If we just let anyone come in and say, I'm a believer, I've been baptized, and I want to baptize my wife, well, um, even though we may be able to say, you can't keep me from doing that, uh, because the Bible says any baptized believer can baptize another one, or it doesn't say that, but that's the practice that we see. Uh, G, the, but when Jesus gave the command to baptize, he gave it to the church. So the church has the authority to say who can baptize and who can't baptize. Does that make, you know, hopefully that's helpful. Uh, my second question today is, do babies that die go to heaven? Well, that seems to be a question that a lot of people have. And I personally believe the answer is yes. There will be others who debate against that and they would say no. I personally believe that yes, that when babies die, they go to heaven. And the reason I believe that is because I believe that they are uh, in a, 
I believe that they're born in sin. Don't get me wrong. I believe that every person who's born, born in, is born in sin. But I believe until babies reach an age of not accountability, we're all accountable for our sin. But until they reach a, a, you know, a time of understanding where they have a cognitive understanding what sin is and that they've sinned against God, I believe that they're under the grace of God that is provided for them through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. There's only one way to heaven, and that's through Jesus. So I believe that when babies die, as they are in this age of innocence, if you will, because of no cognitive understanding of sin and the judgment of God, I believe that the grace that Christ provided at the cross covers their sin. Okay? Um, I believe that David, King David, also believed that when his baby died, that it went to heaven. We read in 2 Samuel uh, chapter 12, when David lost his firstborn son due to David's own sin, David said, can I bring him back again? The answer is no. He says, I shall go to him, but he will not return to me. So David had this understanding that he would see his baby again, that he would go to his lost baby or his baby who had died. Now, David knew that he was going to heaven. He knew himself to be uh, a man after God's own heart. So da David ultimately believed that his final resting place would be in the presence of God. And David believed that he would not only go to God, but he would go to his baby who died. So, so David believed that his baby was safe in the arms of God. Now, there's a great book I'd like to recommend outside of the Bible, of course. And it's this book by John MacArthur that's entitled Safe in the Arms of God. I've read through this book. Uh, but it, the subtitle is Truth from Heaven About the Death of a Child. Uh, this book is very comforting, especially for be people who have lost uh, children or lost babies. Again, the book is entitled Safe in the Arms of God by John MacArthur. I do believe that babies go to heaven when they die because I believe that they are covered by the blood. Uh, they, are, they are saved by grace, which is provided for all sinners at the cross of Christ, okay? My third question today is, it's more of a, well, I guess it's a question, but let me just read it to you. It says, how can the church go into debt to secular institutions when the Scripture demands against it? Well, first of all, I don't believe the Scripture does demand against it. I think we ought to be cautious about debt, and I don't think that we should go into debt unnecessarily, but let me clear up a misunderstanding in this question. The person clearly believes that the Bible uh, does not allow for churches to accumulate or to go into debt to a secular organization. Now, people who, who uh, believe that often, often quote Romans chapter 13, verse 8, which says, Owe no one anything except to love each other, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. And so this is the verse that they would quote, Oh, no man, anything. Well, again, this verse is often interpreted that borrowing money is wrong. But when you read this verse within its context, this verse is more about love than it is about going in debt. So, um, we need, we got to be faithful to the context of Scripture. Now, I could get very, uh, I could play the devil, devil's advocate here if I wanted, because I could also say, well, if you believe that the church shouldn't go in debt, then you should also believe that Christians shouldn't go in debt. So, did you pay cash for your home? Or did you borrow money from the bank? Did you pay cash for your car or did you borrow from a lender? You, you see where I'm going with this? Um, if we take this verse to say that you can't go into debt for any reason, oh, no man, nothing, then really uh, uh, we're going to have a hard time buying homes and driving cars. I don't believe that's what the scripture teaches. I believe that that verse is more about love than it is about debt. Now, Jesus, Jesus approved, I believe, Jesus himself approved 
financial borrowing, borrowing. And the parable of the talents, which is found in Matthew 25, 14 through 30, Jesus commended, now listen to this, Jesus commended the two servants who had wisely invested their money. But he strongly rebuked the unfaithful servant who merely borrowed money entrusted to him. Or, I'm sorry, buried money entrusted to him. Jesus said, you ought to have put my money in the bank, Jesus said. And on my arrival, I would have received my money back with interest. So I believe that the Bible does allow for going into debt. Um, now, we ought to do that cautiously, and I'm going to provide some other reasons, for other questions that we should ask ourselves before we do. But the reality is, is that many churches could not simply operate without borrowing, borrowing or investing. Many families couldn't operate without borrowing or investing. Many Christian farmers could not operate without borrowing or investing. You get the idea? We don't want to be legalistic about this, but we do want to be smart. I don't believe the Scripture does condemn borrowing. I believe it does allow for it. But we ought to be wise in, and biblical in our borrowing. Uh, for example, before you borrow, you should ask yourself the following questions if you're a church. Is the church growing in giving and attendance? I don't think you should borrow if your church is not growing. If it's not growing in its giving or if it's not growing in its attendance, then why would you want to borrow money? Why would you want to go in debt? Second question, does the, her, the, does the church have equity in the property? If you're already, if you're already uh, uh, in over your head, if you have no equity in the property that you already have, then why would you borrow? But if you already have equity in your property, then I believe it's okay to borrow. If your giving and attendance is going up, then I believe it's okay to borrow. The third question. Can the church afford the payment with the current budget? You know you're going to have a payment if you borrow. Well, can you afford it within your current budget? If the answer is no, you shouldn't borrow. If the answer is yes, you can. You can. Another question. Is the church planning a capital campaign to pay back the debt quicker? If you're going in debt and you have no strategic plan to pay it back quickly, then you shouldn't borrow. But if you do have a plan to pay it back qu quickly, like a capital campaign, then I believe it's okay to borrow. Uh, another question, is the church healthy financially and quantitatively? And if the answer is yes, then I believe the Lord allows borrowing. So whether your church should borrow is ultimately up to God uh, through prayer and discernment. And, uh, but the idea that the Bible condemns borrowing is a misunderstanding of what the Scripture teaches. And I gave you the parables of the talents as an example. I believe we ask those wives questions, and if we can answer yes to those questions, and we have a plan to pay back that debt quickly at a low interest rate, then I believe it's okay to borrow, just like our church has here at Edmonds First Baptist. Uh, we went into a loan, a low interest rate loan, a capital campaign, and uh, we are going to have that note, note burning in uh, this next year. And we are thoroughly excited about that. We were able to answer yes to all those questions. And we praise God for our new building and the ability to pay it off quickly. Well, until we meet again, serve the King.